It's often said that the human mind is a machine of pattern recognition, inventing meaning in the randomness of chaos. It's the principal argument of skeptics and detractors of the occult, a chief commandment of atheism. Yet it hasn't stopped millions of people from seeking wisdom in these patterns, many of which predate our written histories. Archetypes and allegories teach us about people, events, and imperatives that contribute to our development as both individuals and members of society at large. We see this play out in tarot. What began as a simple playing card game became a deeply nuanced system of symbolic language with the addition of the triumphs, later called trumps. In gameplay, they mimicked the constant domination and submission of characters and events. The triumph of love as a parade of brilliance and beauty. The triumph of death, indiscriminate of status or wealth. The triumph of eternity and the inheritance of the heavenly kingdom. But to occultists like Jean-Baptiste Alliette, better known as Etiella, they were encapsulations of astrological and alchemical imperatives. Etiella and his school saw larger cosmic patterns in tarot that changed not only their use, but the cards themselves. Tarot was no longer simply a plaything or a pastime. It would forevermore be a tool of inner wisdom. Hi, I'm Fairly Theta, and today I want to talk to you about the Hierophant. I discussed the Hierophant at the beginning of the year as the numerological archetype of the year ahead. But I mostly focused on its role as spiritual bureaucrat, a holdover from his position as the Pope in older decks. To really understand the evolution of this card and unravel its astrological associations with Taurus and the season, we need to start with Eliphas Levi. Like Etiella before him, Levi saw the tarot as symbolic of the magical path. Each card in the Major Arcana, or Grand Secret, related explicitly to a pathway along the Tree of Life, embodying unique lessons for the seeker. Levi saw no coincidence in the number of trumps. Certainly, there were 22 cards, so they corresponded to the 22 letters of the Aleph Bet, a cornerstone of Kabbalistic tradition. In his work with the Tarot de Mose, Levi linked the Pope to the letter Hech, the fifth card to the fifth letter. In the mystic traditions, He is a composite letter representing both the material and the spiritual. Each stroke works to unify our experience with the divine and the world around us. Its topmost horizontal stroke represents the sameness of soul and source. Its downward stroke is one of the sovereign word, and its left leg is one of action, which remains detached as a reminder that choosing benevolent acts is ongoing. This kind of mathematically derived moralism may be exactly what the Pope delivers to the two acolytes who kneel before him, himself a symbol of the divine reorganized and restructured into human systems of order and importance. Levi emphasized the energetic connections between the two pillars and the two acolytes, installing the Pope as the highest point in a pentagram derived of law, order, liberty, and action. The Pope becomes the topmost stroke of his letter, the elevation of these imperatives through union with spirit. But tarot remains a living system, open to interpretation by different minds with different priorities. To esoteric scholar Israel Regardé, the card mirrored the path of Golden Dawn initiates. With his triple cross and triple crown, the Pope sits between two pillars, installing his own form as that of a third. The belief is that these two pillars are the knowledge of Hermes and Solomon, but with the Pope himself centered between them and so many echoes throughout the card, they become another representation of the Tree of Life. The pillar of severity lies to the left, the pillar of mercy to the right, but the kingdom, the crown, and beauty all lie in the middle pillar. In the newest incarnation of tarot, the fifth card of the major arcana came to represent 
the path between wisdom and mercy, an initiation into righteousness. And this triumph did not belong to the figurehead of the Roman church. The Golden Dawn needed their own initiating officer. Enter the Hierophant. The Hierophant was named for the Golden Dawn's highest initiating officer, a spiritual successor to the chief of the Illusion Mystery School, a title which translates to one who shows sacred things. Within their organization, the Hierophant's role was to assume the energy of Osiris, one of their most sacred archetypes, and bring junior members into the elevated understanding that came with initiation. He became a human vessel of sacred creative energy, of masculine potency. To the Golden Dawn, the phallus was not only a physical tool of creation, but the key to divinity and power. It was through Osiris's severed phallus that Isis impregnated herself with Horus, creating the holy family of the Golden Dawn's main canon. This association was cause for another great shift in the card, moving it from the path between wisdom and beauty on Levi's Tree of Life, and installing it between wisdom and mercy. Here, it was no longer a representation of Heh, unity, but of Vav, the nail, connecting the spiritual to the physical. This middle pillar hierophant sounds altogether different from the Pope of the Marseille, but its redesign still bears distinctly papal cues. His clothing is somewhere between ecclesiastical and magical. The red robes over the white tunic are reminiscent of papal vestments for apostolic feast days, and under his feet are the crossed keys of St. Peter, from whom all popes are symbolically descended. But the red and gold robes are also similar to those worn by the Golden Dawn's own Hierophant, his nemesis and crown-topped scepter swapped for the triplicate accessories of an earlier incarnation. Arthur Edward Waite himself acknowledged the woeful admixture of symbolism attached to the card, less the esoteric authority so many would wish to see, and more the exoteric expression of theology as a whole. The Hierophant, he suggested, may be the wooden representation of his own power. One can't help but feel his growing cynicism against the order itself in Waite's words. In pursuit of the middle pillar and all it promises, ceremony often turns to pomp and erodes doctrine no matter how sacred. And this is the cynicism with which so many of us are introduced to the Hierophant. We approach him as nothing more than a figurehead with all the reverence of a modern Vatican tourist. The Hierophant feels more like an obstacle to wisdom than a guardian. And in a way, he's a very real echo of the Golden Dawn itself, dogma and ritual turned rigid. As the century turned, it brought a new Aeon. And a new Aeon requires a new Hierophant. The Thelemic Aeon of Horus was one of individual freedom. And Aleister Crowley did not hesitate to exercise his personal judgment when he undertook his own redesign of the tarot in 1938. His hierophant still occupies the path of Vav indicated by the nails which affix the window behind him, but he is far from the papal bureaucrat that we knew before. The hierophant of the Toth deck is an energetic evolution of the emperor, a priest king empowered by the aeon he ushers in. Crowley associated Chesed, mercy, with the law, and Chokmah, wisdom, with the father, imbuing this hierophant with a supreme authority over both the Esso and Exoteric. Venus, previously an unseen ruler of the card's zodiacal association, materializes before this hierophant with a wild ferocity. Here, she's the Scarlet Woman, both the Sovereign Feminine and Mother of Monstrosity. The Nine Nails tie the card to Yesod, Foundation, and the Moon's Exaltation under Taurus, while the deep, inky blue of the card's background is the color of Nuit, the infinite Thelemic Goddess. Indigo is also the color of Saturn, and as such, it represents both space and time which the Hierophant also honors with his three-ringed wand, all aeons converging. 
And despite this pervasive femininity to the card, the Hierophant remains a masculine energy, himself a phallic symbol, the generative force of initiation. Crowley returns to the pentagram that Levi emphasized in the Marseille Pope, but here it's manifested not in merely suggested shapes, but outlined in currents of energy that actually bear forth the Puer Eternus, the god of the new Aeon. This is not the passive, wooden figurehead of stale ceremony. This is an individual in active communication with his true will. This is not ritual for ritual's sake, but a stretching of spiritual musculature for greater achievement and understanding. However, the Aeon is still young, and birth is a violent experience. The transition from one age into the next is necessarily marked by turmoil and schism. And this is the Hierophant archetype that feels present in the current time. There's a distinctly Uranian energy to the Hierophant's newest incarnation, as much an instigator as an initiator. Amidst the turmoil of a new aeon, the Hierophant unifies old traditions with new energies, initiates us into freedom through communion with the ancient. He's the new face of a timeless force, a convergence of time and space, both familiar and novel. The Book of Toth remarks that it is impossible at the present time to explain this card thoroughly, for only the course of events can show how the new current of initiation will turn out. It remains, as ever, a card in the process of evolution, an eternal microcosm intent on emphasizing and embodying its macrocosmic force. Thank you so much for watching. I write a weekly blog every Friday. Make sure to like and subscribe. And if there's any topics that you'd like me to cover in the future, drop me a comment below. I'll see you next week. Bye.